Hi, I'm Kayla. I'm Peach's virtual assistant. Back when I had a spending problem, it wasn't uncommon for me to walk away with four pairs of shoes put on my credit card. But today I've got it under control and I'm credit card debt free like a boss. Now, check this out. You know, whether you buy gold or whether you buy Apple, you know, I mean, unless you're listening to your neighbor or you've got a broker you absolutely trust, you should do your own homework. I mean, if you go to any website where you see a dealer selling gold, all they're doing is selling gold. They're, you listen to the commercials on uh, CNBC, uh, gold is ready for its next bull run, blah, blah, blah. What type of gold investment best suits you? You know, whether it's an ETF, whether it's a gold mining share that pays a dividend, you know, or whether you want some physical gold bars for nothing more, just the comfort level of having the gold in your hand type of thing. Alrighty, everyone, this is the Money Peach Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Peach, and I'm going to be bringing on some of the most amazing people I can find so they can tell you how they do their life and their money the right way. My guest on the show today is an expert when it comes to investing in gold. His name is Peter Hug. Now, I asked Peter to come on the show to try to convince me why I should believe gold is a good investment strategy. You see, up until this point, I have never touched gold. For me, as personal reasons. I was told that gold is something that is going to be around when the world ends. We're going to have ammunition, we're going to have food, and we're going to be trading gold. Now, I didn't really jump on that belief, so that's why I've never invested in gold. Peter's coming on the show. He says that he is going to change my mind on how I view gold, and I'm actually going to believe it's a good investment strategy for some. So I'm curious to see how this is going to go. So without further ado, let me bring on Peter Hug. He is an expert when it comes to investing in gold. Peter Hug, thank you so much for coming on the show. Excited to have you on. You are, in my mind, I'm going to call you this because you won't say it yourself, but you are a gold expert. I think anybody who has been doing something for about 40 years gets the gets the term expert placed in front of their name. So Peter Hug, gold expert, thank you for coming on the show. That's a pleasure, Chris. Nice to be here. The reason why I wanted to have you on the show is we've talked a lot on this podcast about stocks, bonds, mutual funds, ETFs, investing. We've talked about real estate, all different areas of real estate, whether it's apartment syndication or buying a flip home or buying your first rental. We've talked about all these things, and I have never had anyone come on the show about gold. One of the reasons why is, honestly, I don't know anything about gold. So I almost felt like if I was going to bring somebody on the Money Peach podcast, that I should at least know something about it. And then when someone mentioned your name to me and told me about you being the gold expert, I thought, you know what? It's time. We're going to have you come on the show, talk about gold, because honestly, I just need to learn about this. I don't know if it's for me, but I want to know more about it. So that's the reason why you're here today is we're going to talk about the gold. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. Okay. So I have a whole slew of questions here, but just for starters, give our audience a little bit of background of who you are, where you're calling in from. So we can kind of put a, I guess, not a name to a face, but put you to gold. Okay. Well, uh, currently I'm, uh, I work for a company called Kickle Metals Inc., which is uh, one of the largest, if not the largest uh, precious metals retailer in North America. I actually started in the business uh, in 1973 when I graduated from the University of Toronto. I got my first job was a foreign exchange dealer for one of the, uh, at that time, the largest uh, retail foreign exchange firms in the world called Deke Pereira. And I became their uh, head trader for their Canadian operation. They had offices in some 80 countries. And uh, then in 76, I was offered a job from a financial institution in Canada that became the uh, second biggest wholesaler of precious metals in Canada next to the Bank of Nova Scotia called Guardian Trust and uh, developed the precious metals program for them in 78, which uh, turned out to be excellent timing because we uh, actually caught the uh, gold rush of 79 when gold went from $100 an ounce to 850 and silver went from about $4 an ounce to $50 an ounce with the Hunt brothers uh, trying to uh, corner the silver market. So I, I've sort of seen the ups and downs in the markets ever since 73. I've seen gold as low as $100 an ounce, and I've seen gold as high as $1,925 an ounce in 2011. So, in, you know, in that context, uh, I think I've got pretty good experience in the business. So I have heard over the years, people that I know that invest in gold, one of the things they're always telling me is like, you need to invest in gold because, and they give me this like scare tactic almost. And that's why I've always been so afraid of investing in gold is it's like, 
you need to go hoard as much ammo, guns, and gold as possible, right? And yeah. so I feel like gold really has this doom and gloom attached to it. And my my mindset is this. When everything else goes bankrupt somewhere or when the when the world collapses, the only thing people are going to be trading is gold. For me, I say, no, the only thing people are going to be trading is food, <laughs> guns, and ammo. You know, if Wells Fargo and Bank of America and Home Depot and Target and Southwest Airlines, if all those companies, they don't exist anymore – I don't really care who has gold. I want to know who has food. I totally agree with you, Chris. I mean, uh, I did an analysis about three years ago when I I was doing a lot of uh, speaking on the sort of the conference circuit. And what I did was I did two things. First, I looked back in uh, at the 7980 sort of scenario and I compared it to today. And I wanted to see what the difference was in the markets today relative back when there were no computers, when everything was done by the telephone. uh, You know, nobody had an iPhone. You know, I looked at the products that were available in 79 and 80 and compared them to the products that are available in the market today. And ironically, there's only really uh, very, very modest differences in what the products are today that were available in 79, 80. 79, 80, you could buy, obviously, you could buy physical metals, you could buy futures, you could buy options, you could buy mutual funds, you could buy gold mining shares, silver mining shares along the same lines as you can today. The only difference today is uh, the only new product today really in the market are two. And one is the ETFs and the other are what I would call ratio contracts where you can play the difference between uh, the value of silver relative to gold or platinum relative to palladium. So those are really the only two new inventions in the the 40 years that this market has, has, has traded. And then I looked at what was the psychology of the investor back in 79 relative to the psychology of the investor today. Uh, What I did was I broke them into basically four groups. The groups that I'm about to talk to you about were the exact same groups that were present in 79 that are present today. So you have a client that calls you and, uh, you know, when you go to a conference and you make a speech, whether you're bullish or bearish the market, they, you know, the first question that comes out of an investor's mind is, should I buy gold? You know, my response to that question is, what's your motivation? And when you look at the motivation of somebody that buys gold, it basically breaks into sort of four psychological groups. The first group is the one that you just touched on, which is sort of the end of worlders that, you know, that have been basically told the story that the financial system is totally going to collapse and you need gold as a barter system. You know, that story is not new. That story was around in 79 when inflation was running at 18 percent. I never bought the story. Uh, You know, I've never been one to create a situation where you buy an investment or make an investment based on fear. Again, my argument to them is the same as, as your comment right now. If the world were financially to collapse and the fiat money system were to disappear and there was absolute chaos on the streets. I mean, quite frankly, I don't think a one ounce gold bar is going to do you any good. I think if, you know, if you've got energy in any kind of format or food or shelter or ammunition, that's likely to be a much better barter system than gold. But the fact is that this group believes that this is a very real possibility. And in that context, you have to respect the group because it does account for a relatively serious offtake of the physical precious metals market, in, especially in North America, more specifically in the United States. The second group is a group that I call more the conservative investor that looks at gold as something that should be part of a balanced portfolio. There you run into the analysts that tell these investors, yeah, buy 10%, 20%, 30%, whatever the number, and hold that as a insurance position in your portfolio. Unfortunately, these analysts always end the sentence there, and there's a second part to that sentence. If it's part of your portfolio, it has to be calibrated as part of your portfolio. So you can't just ignore it. You don't just buy 10% of your portfolio in gold and then just forget about it. What you do is you've got to calibrate it against your portfolio. So what I mean by that is Just to give you some simple math examples, if you had bought gold in 2008 at $400 an ounce, and in 2011, gold was at $1,900 an ounce, I could pretty much guarantee you if you went in with the mindset that you wanted to hold 10% of your portfolio in gold, that that a portion of your gold that you bought in 2008 probably represented now maybe 18 or 25% of your portfolio. In that context, you have to sell eight or 15% of your portfolio to bring it back to 10. Vice versa, had you bought it in 2011, 
at $1,925 at the top of the market. And then in 2010, the gold market is sitting down at 1,080. The percentage of gold against your portfolio was probably not 10%. It was maybe down at 3%. So now you've got to buy 7%. So when you go in with the mindset that it's an insurance position at 10%, you've got to recalibrate that the same way you would recalibrate your stock or bond position from a balanced perspective. So when you say recalibrate, it's just another word for saying you're going to rebalance your portfolio. Rebalance. Exactly. Okay. One of the things I see with gold is why is there a belief that gold is always going to be worth something? And and so the way I look at it, the way I'm asking this question is, you know, if I, if I put my money into say a, an ETF, you know, like a, we'll say an index fund, We'll, we'll use an index fund. You know, I have a pretty good understanding of, okay, this money goes into the market, goes into these companies. These companies either grow or they shrink depending on how they grow or how they shrink depends on, you know, the appreciation or the depreciation of that asset, but also if there's going to be dividends or not. So I have an understanding like there's people at this company who are working to grow it. That company is producing something, you know, a widget or something that's making them more profitable. And as a shareholder, I get to enjoy some of those profits or enjoy some of those dividends or enjoy the appreciation. Now, with gold, I feel like the only reason why gold goes up and down is what people perceive it doing by selling or buying more of it, by is that the supply and demand on gold. Am I, am I correct to think along those lines or how am I wrong? No, I think your basic premise is correct. It really depends on, on your psychology. And, you know, I can make a case that, you know, your argument would not play well with people uh, potentially that have historically seen the benefits of holding gold. And I mean, it sounds like a sort of a nebulous comment, but, you know, gold is extremely portable. So when you have situations, I'll give you an example, three years ago, when we had the Cyprus bank issue, uh, the Europeans bought gold, uh, especially in Cyprus, where basically uh, 90% of your bank assets were frozen. In Vietnam in uh, 74, when the South Vietnamese uh, were trying to leave the country, the currency was absolutely worthless. And in that context, they were able to take out gold and start a new life with gold because gold maintained its value. When you look at Venezuela, you look at some of the South American emerging economies that are in serious problems with inflation running at 180 percent. In their context, gold does maintain its value and appreciate relative their currency. So when you speak to it in an American context and you speak to it from a millennial context, you know, they haven't experienced any of these issues. So they they don't see gold as sort of that safe haven play. But when you look at gold from a trading perspective, there have been multitudes of opportunities to make serious money in the gold market. So, I, you know, I consider gold a commodity the same way you would consider oil. I mean, I would imagine that you would not dismiss the fact that oil is sometimes a good investment. No, I agree. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And gold at times is a good investment. I'm not one of these guys that says gold is the end all be all. But there are times when gold will behave extremely well in an environment that will give you a return that will offset some of your risks in, in your overall portfolio. So I see it more as a portfolio as something to put into your portfolio as a position. And I'm not suggesting you put 40, 50, 60 percent of your assets in gold. But there are times when gold makes sense to hold as an investment. So I look at it as an investment from a capital gains perspective. I look at it from a perspective of being able to trade it in and out. And at times it's reasonable to hold a position in gold, sometimes a larger position than not because there are certain events that are occurring in the world that will create an upward lift in the gold market and it's an investment. So that's the way I look at it. I don't look at it as something that if the world ends, it's something that you need to protect yourself with. Hey guys, I just wanted to pause and take a second to say thank you from me to you for listening to and supporting the Money Beach podcast. Without listeners like you, this show definitely would not be possible. So thank you. You know, the number one question that I receive is this, Peach, I just don't know where to start when it comes to my money. You know, so many of us out there are living paycheck to paycheck. We have tons of debt. We're not making any headway. We can't save any money. We want to go on a freaking vacation where we pay cash for it. Oh, and let's talk about retirement savings and kids college planning on top of that, right? Where do you start? Well, that's why we created the cash flow formula. The cash flow formula is the same system that Andrea and I use to pay off $52,000 in debt in only seven months. 
And the best part is it's 100% free, meaning we are going to send you the free tools and a free lesson on how to set up your own cash flow formula. So to get started, go over to getcashflowformula.com. That's G-E-T cashflowformula.com. Once again, head on over to getcashflowformula.com to get your free copy and your free lesson on how to get started the right way. All right, guys, now back to the show. I'm on the Kitco website right now. There's ETFs and like metal ETFs. You have the Gold Trust iShares is one of your one of the options here. So I'm looking at that, and so it, it, now it's starting to make a lot more sense. As you're not telling people, hey, go make sure you grab a bunch of gold bars and stick them under your bed for when the world ends. You're saying just like you would invest in Apple or Amazon or you know Wells Fargo stock. You're saying it's a good idea to diversify your portfolio by maybe having a small percentage of like a gold type ETF or something in that portfolio to hedge against when the market does go down and gold is there as a standard. Yeah. I mean, just to give you an example, I mean, four weeks ago, uh, gold was about 7% below where it is right now. So, I mean, had you picked the bottom, you'd be up 7%. I mean, you couldn't say that in a lot of the equity plays had you been in there four weeks ago, given what, uh, you know, the carnage we've seen in the equity market over the past week. So, you know, again, there are opportunities to get in and out of the market from a trader's perspective. Uh, the same way you would trade, uh, you know, the uh, same way you might trade a 10 year bond or the same way you might trade, in a, you know, an Apple stock or, you know, IBM or Microsoft. There's two ways to do it. One is you just buy and hold. And over a period of time, I think gold will outperform or at least maintain its value relative inflation over an extended period of time. Or you can trade it the way you would actively trade a stock or a bond. What is the track record on gold look like over the past, say, 50 years? Well, I mean, again, it depends. You know, it's all a matter of entry and exit points. I mean, had you bought gold in 74 at, at, at $100 an ounce, you'd still be happy. Uh, had you bought gold in uh, 2011 at 1925, you'd be miserable. So I guess what I'm asking is, you know, say I'm looking at the S&P 500 over the past, you know, 50, 60 years, I see some trends. Those trends, they don't predict the future, but it allows me to have a better educated you know, I guess, guess or an educated investment in the future based on, okay, I know that every seven to 10 years, there looks like there's been a correction, except for obviously the one we're in right now. It seems like whenever there's a correction, there's a better increase on the end of that correction when it turns back into a, a bull market. So I have this kind of, I don't want to say I can, I can predict the future, but I want to say is I, you know, no one can predict the future, but I know looking at the history, you know, there's definitely trends. Are there similar trends like that with gold? Yes, there is. I mean, if you look at gold, you can see gold cycles tend to trade in about eight year cycles. Okay. Uh, and if you look at gold at the peak of 2011, I'm thinking the, the bear market cycle in gold has probably ended, but I'm not suggesting that gold's going to go to $2,000 an ounce. I mean, it's going to require some catalysts to get it back up to those types of levels that we saw in 2011. But you look at commodity cycles, commodity cycles in general you can track commodity cycles in commodities the same way you can in equities. Now, over a long period of time, I would not argue with you that equities, you know, using the Warren Buffett sort of philosophy, uh, are better investments than gold. All I'm suggesting is that gold at certain times in cycles would make sense to have an exposure to from an investment perspective. And you will get returns of uh, equal to or much greater than the equity components of your portfolio in certain cycles. You know, I would agree with that because I look at bonds and, and equities or bonds and mutual funds or bonds and ETFs or stocks and bonds. And you look at, okay, the history in the equity market, you know, they've returned about eight to 10% over the last hundred years, whereas bonds are in the five to 7% range. So, mm -hmm. Just going off those numbers, most people would say, well, you shouldn't invest in bonds because obviously equities have done better. But almost every single financial expert you talk to would say you should always have a little bit of bond mixture in there to protect you against the, the bear markets or the downturns. And now I understand you're adding in gold, why, why that makes sense. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing you have to look at is to your risk tolerance. I mean, you know, when you're 65 years of age, you're going to be a little less... Uh, open to the aspect of having 90 or 100 percent of your assets in equities, uh, you know, it just that's just not a prudent investment because, at the, you know, at that age in your life, you just don't have the comfort level as you certainly you don't have a longevity level of taking any major hit. If you get a five year down cycle in the equity market, you're done. 
So, you know, when you're 20 or 25, you can take those risks. Uh, you can take a more aggressive risk in the equity market because you've got more time and more space uh, to, you know, to wait the market out for the rebound. So, again, it, it comes down to where your risk reward is and what you're worried about. And, you know, you're looking at the Fed now raising rates. They're talking about raising three to four more times next year. I mean, I just don't see how the equity market is going to be able to withstand that. So then what does the Fed do? Do they lower uh, rates coming into the cycle in 2019? If they do that, what, what happens to the U.S. dollar? Now you've got a situation where you've got trade issues with China. You know, Trump's argument with these tariffs with China hurts his base because where the prices are going to go up are basically where his base shops. So now you've got potentially if the Fed starts to slow down on, on interest rate increases and you have inflation picking up at the retail level because of the tariffs, it's going to hurt the dollar substantially. Whenever the dollar is on a downtrend, that tends to be very positive for, the, for gold. So, you know, you could be running into a gold cycle here that could just be starting to get its legs. So to have a 5% exposure in the gold side, and you don't need to have it in the ETFs, you know, maybe you have it in a major miner like a Barrick or a Newmont or one of the streaming companies like, um, um, oh God. Well, so I get just, what you're saying. You're saying instead of, you know, you don't have to say, I'm going to invest just in a gold iShares type program. You're going to, you can invest in mining operations for gold. Yeah. And if you get some of the seniors, uh, that'll pay a dividend. Uh, you know, you've got a little bit of comfort level in there and you've got a little bit of protection against your overall portfolio. So Peter, this definitely has helped me understand gold. I mean, before we hit record, I literally thought we're going to be talking about that, you know, oh, the world's crashing. We need to go grab gold bars and hide them under our bed. And they're going to be worth something when the world ends. So now I'm, I'm definitely have a lot more open-mindedness to the idea of diversifying your portfolio. And I like what you said, not using, you know, don't use half of your portfolio and put it in gold, you know, use it as a tool like you would with any stock or equity or bond or, or anything like that. And uh, you do make some very valid points that, like you said, as the dollar tends to go down, that helps gold. It has in the past. And we, like, like I said, none of us are saying we're predicting the future here, but the interest rates are going up and, you know, there's tariffs that we're dealing with. And there's a lot of things going on in the economy that's I could see is favorable. Now, in no way is this investment advice, are we not telling you to go out and buy gold everywhere? We're just saying gold is a good option for some. Yeah. And, you know, whether you buy gold or whether you buy Apple, uh, you know, I mean, unless you're listening to your neighbor or you've got a broker you absolutely trust, you should do your own homework. And there, I mean, I'm not trying to plug Kitco here, but Kitco really is a relatively unique company in the gold space. I mean, if you go to any website where you see a dealer selling gold, all they're doing is selling gold. Or you listen to the commercials on uh, CNBC, uh, you know, gold is ready for its next bull run, blah, blah, blah. But what Kitco offers people that want to understand the market is on Kitco.com, we offer about 20, 30 commentaries a day. And some of them are bullish, some of them are bearish, but they at least try to explain why markets are moving. So at least investors can read those things and make an educated decision as to when or if they should even get into the gold market. So, you know, the Kitco.com site, I think, is an invaluable tool to people that first want to understand the market and also want to get various insights from, again, a variety of people, not all who are bullish, that sort of are outlining why they think a market is uh, the metals markets are going to move a certain direction. And then you can make your own decision and then decide from that decision what type of gold investment best suits you, you know, whether it's an ETF, you know, whether it's a gold mining share that pays a dividend, you know, or whether you want some physical gold bars for nothing more, just the comfort level of having the gold sort of in your hand type. So I think the takeaway here for the listeners is this. If gold is something that you know nothing about, or if gold is something that maybe you've thought this should be in my portfolio, do not go and buy any right now. Instead, use this podcast today is step one as your tool of learning a little bit about gold, because that's what I'm doing. But step two is we'll put links in our show notes. It's it's real easy, kitco.com, K-I-T-C-O. And it is a resource where you can go and you can learn. I'm on their site right now. You can learn anything you want to know about gold. And they also have real-time reports of what's going on with gold right now. But like I said, don't listen to a podcast and think, oh, 
I got to go jump into gold right now because first of all, none of us said go jump into gold, right? We can't give investment advice like that. We're just saying gold is something that you know we should all look at. And we're here to improve our finances. We're here to build wealth. We're here to move forward with our finances. And one of the ways we can do that is by educating ourselves. So if gold is something that you think is a possibility for your future, for your portfolio, I would definitely suggest you learn more about it before you pull the trigger on doing anything. So this podcast is one resource. Then we have kickco.com. And Peter, thank you so much for coming to the show and just sharing with us a little bit about gold, how it works, the history of it. I definitely learned something and you have definitely opened my mind to gold. You're welcome, Chris. Thank you for inviting me. And just like that, we wrap up another amazing episode of the Money Peach Podcast. All the show notes, the links, anything that Peter and I talked about can be found over at moneypeach.com forward slash session 116. That's moneypeach.com forward slash session 116. Thank you guys so much for listening and supporting the show. Have a great week and God bless you. Boom. 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 Boom.